So in this video, we're gonna build on what we've done earlier with edge detectors and latches, and we're gonna use them to build flip-flops. So flip-flops are like latches in that they are memory elements, but they are also clocked. So the control inputs that we saw earlier in the latch, for example, set and reset, and this, again, this little bar over the names of the signals just means that they're active low or they have their intended effect when they're low, not when they're high. And we're still gonna have our control inputs, set and reset, um, but this time they are only going to affect the output. So they're only allowed, the goal is to build something such that the control input set and reset are only allowed to affect the circuit outputs, Q and Q bar. And again, we can just say Q because we know that Q bar is always going to be the opposite of Q for valid latch operation. And they will only have an effect at the clock edge. So once per clock cycle. So you can think of it as sort of like a clock looks like this, basically just a 50% duty cycle square wave. And depending on whether the flip-flop is positive edge triggered or negative edge triggered, let's just consider the case where it's positive edge triggered. So I'm gonna put a little arrow here and all the positive going transitions of the clock. And basically I wanna build a circuit that does kind of the same thing as a latch. It's a memory element, but it's like it will only evaluate the control inputs at certain points in the clock cycle, specifically the rising edge of the clock. So only at the rising edge of the clock will the flip-flop look at its control inputs and make Q reflect those values accordingly. Um, and similarly, of course, with the um, a negative edge triggered flip-flop does the same thing, but it's like the flip-flop, it operates exactly like a latch or very similar to a latch, except that it will only evaluate its inputs at the negative going transition of the clock, at the negative edge of the clock. So how do we build that? And in fact, we have all the building blocks we need to build it. But first, let's summarize. So we can say that flip-flops are memory elements just like latches, but unlike latches, which change or the outputs of the latches change at any point um, whenever the inputs change. But um, flip-flops, on the other hand, are clocked. So they have a clock input and the output should only change at the clock edge. So inputs are only evaluated and thus the outputs are only affected at the edge of the clock. And if all this occurs at the rising edge of the clock, the flip-flop is called positive edge triggered. And if this occurs on the falling edge of the clock, the flip-flop is said to be negative edge triggered. So flip-flop has to choose a lane. It's gotta be one or the other. But the idea is that the outputs can only change once per clock cycle, depending on what the inputs are at that time in the clock cycle. So either at the positive edge of the clock or the negative edge of the clock. And we can build flip-flops, and in fact we will, based on these familiar building blocks that we already have seen, such as the NAN latch and edge detectors. So previously, we have seen both positive and negative edge detectors. We know what those guys are, and we understand the latch from the last video. So let's go ahead and build a flip-flop. So this is my familiar latch, and we have a clock input. Um, I can make this positive or negative edge triggered, it doesn't really matter, but let's start with positive edge triggered. So what I'm gonna do, I'm still gonna have, so again, this is my latch. I am still, oops, I am still gonna have my um, active low set and reset inputs to my NAND latch. I'm gonna just draw a little box around it to indicate that this building block, it's like I just took a NAND latch, like an IC that had a NAND latch, and I just 
plugged it into my breadboard. So this part is just a NAND latch whose operation we are already familiar with. And I'm just gonna add two things. So I'm gonna show you what I'm gonna add and then we're gonna go over why this works. So I am gonna add two more NAND gates. And into each end gate, I am going to have an input and I'm gonna call them set and reset. And note that this time they don't have those funny bars over their heads. So what is the other input? So the other input is I'm going to call it clock star. And I'll tell you why it's not an actual clock signal. What it is, is it's the result of the clock input going into an edge detector. So if, as we know, a clock signal looks like this, it's a 50% duty cycle square wave, and an edge detector will emit a signal with the same frequency as the clock, except it's no longer a 50% duty cycle. Instead, it will just have a short pulse at either the rising or falling edge of the clock, depending on whether we're looking at a positive or negative edge detector, respectively. So let me draw some more boxes, and I'm going to just tell you what these things are. So I'm going to call this, it has a name, This is a pulse steering circuit, and this is an edge detector. And again, it can be either a positive or negative edge detector. And to know the difference between those, I mean, it's basically just swapping out an end gate for a NOR gate, but you can consult the previous videos. Um, but we know how to do that. So let's see why this works. But before I do that, I'm gonna do one other thing which is I'm gonna draw another block around this whole thing so that I can clearly see the inputs and outputs to my block. This is a flip-flop. And specifically, it's actually called an SR flip-flop for set reset flip-flop. And this has some very peculiar characteristics as we'll see. Um, but if I just wanted to represent this as a block, so you can imagine that if I were like roughly sketching out a schematic, I wouldn't want to draw all these different things. I would just want to draw like a box with inputs and outputs and say, this is a flip-flop. So I'm going to show you the conventions for that. So my flip-flop is going to look rectangular like this. It is going to have this strange triangle input, that is always going to be the clock. So here I have the S and R inputs, and I have two outputs, which are Q and Q bar. And this is a positive edge triggered flip-flop, specifically SR flip-flop. I'm just going to use F dash F to denote flip-flop. And how do I know it's positive edge triggered? So I'm going to tell you how. If I had a negative edge triggered flip-flop, I would denote it. So again, I would still have this same triangle shaped input, but I would put a little bubble on the outside of it. And that tells me that this is a negative edge triggered flip-flop and specifically an SR flip-flop. Okay, so let's analyze some of the characteristics of this thing. I've gone ahead and taken the liberty of drawing out the truth tables for the NAND gate. And as you can see, um, the properties of the NAND gate are basically that it will be high at all times and only output is zero only if both inputs are high. And for the NAND latch, so just to review the properties of the NAND latch, so remember that the inputs of the NAND latch are set and reset, but they've got these funny bars here. Why? 
to indicate that they're active low. In other words, they perform their intended function to, that is to either set for S or reset R when their signals are low or logic zero. So um, over here in the first row, this is when S and R are both low or both active. And if you think about the names of the signal, it really doesn't make sense to say that I'm going to both set and reset the latch at the same time, right? They're active low here in this row. They're both active at the same time. I'm going to call this the invalid condition. Um, over here, this row, this is the set condition. Why? Because set is low, that is active, and reset is high, that is inactive. So I'm setting the latch. And what does it mean to set a latch? It means to make the Q output one. Of course, the Q bar output is just the complement of Q. And in a valid um, non-latch state, at least. So this condition over here, I guess you, I hope you can see, is the reset condition. So reset is low. Recall it, it is active low. Reset is active and set is inactive. So I'm resetting the latch. What does it mean to reset or clear a latch? It means to make Q zero. Q bar is the complement of zero. And when they are both high, that is they're both inactive, that's the hold condition. They do nothing. I'm neither setting nor resetting the latch in this state. Okay, so back to this pulse steering circuit. Really what I want to understand is what all this does. How does this change the operation of my NAND latch over here? And hence, how does it change the output? And basically my idea is to derive a truth table for the flip-flop, for the SR flip-flop. And to do that, like, basically, I'm going to refresh your memory on the edge detector, but essentially, and you can go back and watch the video, but the edge detector is just a circuit. It's a very simple circuit that takes advantage of this phenomenon of propagation delay. Again, like I said, it's an extremely simple circuit that either has an end gate or a NOR gate. And it takes this clock input, which is basically a 50% duty cycle at a specific frequency, and it will output a signal of the same frequency, except that at every either rising edge, so I need to pick one. So either at the rising edge of the clock or the falling edge of the clock, it will output a pulse. So if it's a positive edge detector, the edge detector will output a short pulse at every rising edge of the clock. And if it's a negative edge detector, it will output a short pulse at every falling edge of the clock. Right? And this is just to remind you. So the timing diagram of an edge detector. So again, this is all review so far. There's nothing fancy here, really. So if I have the timing diagram for a clock, and it looks like this. So this is supposed to be a 50% duty cycle square wave with a specific frequency. And this is the output of the edge detector. So again, if I'm talking about a positive edge detector, then what I would expect to see is an output signal that has exactly the same frequency, but at the rising edge of the clock input, it will instead output a short pulse. Of course, we know that there is a slight propagation delay between the output and the input because you don't get anything for free. But for our purposes, we're going to assume that it's so minimal in comparison with the clock period that we can just neglect it. So essentially, so this is a rising edge detector and a negative edge detector is very similar. Let's actually take the time to draw it. So if I were to draw the output of a negative edge detector, I would have the same input, except that now every falling edge of the clock, like so, I would have a small pulse. So again, I hope you can see that these are the same frequency signals and how do I know that? Um, I know that because if I measure a period as being from rising edge to rising edge, that's all this. 
But actually, it would be the same thing as saying it's from the falling edge of the clock to the falling edge of the next cycle. And I can see that it's the same period. Or if I want to look here, the rising edge to rising edge actually does still correspond to rising edge to rising edge of the output of a positive edge detector. So it has the same period and therefore the same frequency. So armed with all this knowledge, what I can see here is... Due to the properties of a NAND gate, I know, so I'm looking at this row over here, I know that the output to this NAND gate, this set bar signal, which is the output of this NAND gate, is only going to be low, right? It's the output of this NAND gate, and it's only going to be low if both its inputs are high. Now, I know that its input is only ever or this input is only ever going to be high at this pulse at the um, when the um, output pulse is high of my edge detector. So basically when it's detected the edge of the clock. In other words, to summarize this or rephrase it, this signal is only going to ever be high when it detects a clock edge, right? That's its job is to be an edge detector. And so this output is only ever going to be low. This set bar to my latch is only ever going to be low when this is also high. My set signal is high. And I'm going to use, I'm going to write this down. I'm going to formalize it, but I'm going to use this same logic. Again, it's a bit confusing, so listen carefully. But I can see that basically I have no chance, like this signal, this what I've denoted as clock star, this signal is always going to be low. So I'm going to be in one of these rows of the NAND gate truth table. It's always going to be low unless an, a clock edge has been detected. And only at that point will it be high. And if my other signal, the reset, is high, then this NAND gate will output a low. Under all other conditions, it will output a high. And so reset bar, this reset bar signal is only ever going to be low when reset is high and it's the edge of the clock. Okay, but let's formalize this. Okay, so I've gone ahead and prepared a truth table for the SR flip-flop or set and reset as I've denoted them here. So set and reset or reset and set. And I've also included in my flip-flop, um, so I have my outputs, my Q and Q bar outputs, and I also have my internal signals, S bar and R bar, or set bar and reset bar. So the first thing I'm going to try to convince you of is this last row of the truth table. So what does it mean? It means that um, I put sort of like the wild card here. So it doesn't matter what S and R bar. And actually, it doesn't matter what clock is, except I'm going to make um, one further caveat, which is that the clock should not be on the rising edge. So again, this is a positive edge triggered SR flip-flop. So the only interesting thing should be occurring on the positive edge of the clock. So when I say star here, really what I mean is not the positive edge of the clock, but at any other time in the cycle. So what am I looking at over here. So if I'm looking at the output of my edge detector, I am basically looking at any other part of my clock cycle that is not the rising edge. So basically where the edge detector is not outputting this little pulse. And if that is the case, if um, the edge detector is, outputs a low, then I've got a zero coming into both my NAND gates and looking at my NAND gate truth table, if at least one of the inputs is zero, regardless of what the other input is, okay, crucially, then my output will be high. So in both the, in all these cases, regardless of what S and R are, if my edge detector is not outputting the pulse, meaning that it has detected, in this case, a positive edge of the clock, my Output of my pulse during circuit, so the outputs basically of these NAND gates, so not to get fancy about it, that's what they are, they are going to output a 1. 
So set bar and reset bar are going to be one. So that's the first thing I'm going to write. I know that. I know that regardless of what the inputs to my circuit set and reset are, that if I am not at the edge of the clock, then S bar and R bar, these internal signals have got to be high. Why? Because at least one of the inputs to this NAND gate over here, to these NAND gates over here, at least one of the inputs is going to be zero. And I know that from the properties of a NAND truth table, if at least one of the inputs is zero, the output is high. And that's what this last row reflects. And so I know that from my NAND latch truth table, if S bar and R bar are high, then I am in this hold condition. So already I can see something interesting here. So this is a clocked circuit. Like I said, the flip-flop is a clocked logic element. And if I am not at the, in this case, rising edge of the clock, then I am in the hold condition. So regardless of if I'm flipping S and R back and forth, my control inputs, it doesn't matter what I'm doing to them as long as then my Q and Q bar are going to be in the hold condition. And I'm going to write that here. Okay, so the next thing that I'm going to look at is all the other cases where I'm at a rising edge of the clock. And I know that this input is going to be high. And remember, it's only high at the rising edge of the clock. So if it's high, if the input to this NAND gate, and like, let's label them. So let's call this NAND gate one and NAND gate two. So NAND gate one output set bar and NAND gate two outputs reset bar. Okay, so at the rise, I'm at the rising edge of the clock. I know already, I can assume that this signal is high. And remember, it's only high for a very brief period at the beginning of every clock cycle. And now I'm in this row of the truth table. I'm looking at the case where this input, which is S or set, is zero. This input is zero. Well, I know that basically I'm in one of these conditions, either zero one or one zero of the NAND gate truth table, meaning the NAND gate will output a high. So I'm gonna put that here. So these are both gonna be high. And I know again, that's similar to this row over here. I know that's the hold condition for my NAND latch. So if both S and R are zero, Q and Q bar are gonna remain the same as what they were in the previous clock cycle. Okay, now let's look at the next case. In the next case, S is zero. So again, if one of the inputs to my NAND gate is zero, I know that the output of the NAND gate is gonna be one. So I'm just gonna write that here. But here, R is one. So both inputs to this NAND gate that I've labeled two are going to be high. That's the condition for my NAND gate to output a zero. So reset bar is going to be zero. And this is the reset condition for my NAND latch, remember? Meaning that Q is gonna be zero and Q bar is gonna be one. Where do I get that from? I get that from here. That's this row of my NAND latch truth table. So I'm just gonna copy over those values for zero and one for Q and Q bar. So zero and one. And similarly, when S is high, then both inputs to this NAND gate that I've labeled one are going to be high. Set bar is going to be zero. So I'm going to write that right now. And reset bar is going to be high. Why? Because I have a zero coming in from here. Therefore, I'm in one of these rows of my NAND gate truth table and it's going to output a one like so. So this is the set condition for my NAND latch. So Q is going to be high. So remember, setting a latch means that I'm making Q high. Q bar is the complement of Q. Now, the final row is where S and R are both high. And I hope you can see from the same reasoning here that when S and R are both high, that means the inputs to both these NAND gates, 
both inputs are going to be high and therefore they're both going to output zero. And let's write that. And that brings me to this invalid row of my Nanlatch truth table. So I am going to say this is the invalid condition. And so now I hope you can see why I've removed the bars from S and R. I've called it, it's not called the S bar, R bar flip flop truth table. It's called the S R flip flop truth table. So how does it differ? It differs in two important ways or actually three important ways from the NAN latch. So one is that it is clocked. And so it has three inputs instead of two inputs. Okay. One of those inputs is a clock. It only changes at the rising edge of the clock again, because I'm assuming that it's positive edge triggered, or I've told you that it's positive edge triggered. But I hope you realize that if I had said negative edge triggered, all this would be the same, except that I would have down arrows over here for the clock. And Okay, so this brings us to the JK flip-flop. So hopefully now we understand all our building block components. So we know all about the edge detector. We have met the pulse steering circuit, which is just a very fancy way for saying two NAND gates. And we know all about our NAND latch. So to make a JK flip-flop, it's really simple. All I have to do is take an SR flip-flop and make the following changes. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this output Q like so. So work with me here. And I'm gonna feed it into this NAND gate. And then similarly, I'm gonna take this output Q, if I said Q before, I meant Q bar. And now I'm taking Q and I'm gonna feed that guy into the input of this NAND gate. Okay, so I hope you realize that the operation of a three input NAND gate is very similar to the operation of a two input NAND gate with only the following change, that the output of a three input NAND gate will be low only when all its inputs are high at the same time. Okay, so given this information, and I'm gonna write it down, we are gonna build the truth table for the JK flip-flop. Okay, so I've taken this opportunity to just sort of uh, verbally remind you of what a NAND gate does. So instead of writing an eight row truth table for all of its three inputs, I've just kind of written it out logically. If any of its inputs are low, it outputs high, which is basically logic one. And if all of its inputs are high, and only if all of its inputs are high, it outputs low, which is basically logic zero. So just let's keep that as a reminder. The other thing I've done is I've gone ahead and built a truth table for a negative edge triggered JK flip-flop just to change things up a little bit. So the only way that this differs from the SR flip-flop is now all my clock arrows are down to indicate that all the exciting stuff happens at the falling edge of the clock and at no other time in the um, clock cycle. Okay, and as before, I am gonna look at the last row over here where basically by star over here, I mean not the falling edge of the clock, okay? So when that edge detector is not outputting a funny pulse, right? And I can see from here, from my circuit, that if the edge, if these the output of the edge detector, what I've called clock star, 
is not outputting a pulse, meaning it's low, right? So at any other point in the clock cycle, well, I've just said that the operation of the three input NAND is such that if any of its inputs are low, it outputs high. Well, I know for a fact, regardless of what J and K are or any of the other inputs to these NAND gates, that if at least one of its inputs are low, it's gonna output a high regardless. So both these NAND gates are gonna output a high. So I'm just gonna write that here. And I hope you can recall that actually this is the hold condition. So what does that tell me? What does this row mean? This just means that at any point in the clock cycle that is not the falling edge of the clock, it doesn't matter what J and K are. It doesn't matter if I try to set or reset or whatever to do whatever I, like if I change any of the control inputs, it doesn't matter because I am not at the falling edge of the clock. So I could fiddle with J and K, the control inputs, as much as I want, but if it's not the falling edge of the clock, it will have no effect on my outputs. They will remain the same. And it's only at the falling edge that J and K will have some effect on the output. And let's see how exactly. So first thing, um, let's consider all these conditions for J and K. The one I'm gonna look at, I will start, um, I will start with something easy, okay? So let's start with this condition over here, okay? So I know it's the falling edge of the clock, which means that my edge detector is outputting a little pulse, which means that for a very short period of time following the falling edge of the clock, this signal is going to be high. Well, what about J and K? They are gonna be low. And actually, I'm gonna take this opportunity to rename my inputs now. My inputs are no longer set and reset. My inputs are now called J and K. So I know at the falling edge of the clock, so this signal here is high for a very short period of time, but J and K are both zero. So what is this NAND gate gonna output? I don't even have to look at the third input to it. I know already that they are both going to output a high. So that means that my internal signals or my interim signals S bar and R bar, which are these guys, they are gonna be high. So I'm gonna denote that here as high. And again, I know that's my hold condition. Okay, what about this row of the truth table? Okay, so I've, it's a falling edge of the clock, therefore, my output of my edge detector is going to be momentarily high. This input is going to be high. J is going to be low. Therefore, regardless of what this is, the output here is going to be high. That's S bar. So I'm going to write that. So S bar is high. What about over here? Over here, I've got the input. So I have... Um, this input, which is coming from the edge detector, that's high. K is high. So let's look at this condition. Let's break it up. So I can have the case where, and recall that this is Q. So if my previous output of my latch was zero over here, okay, if Q was zero, then I have a zero, one, one coming into my NAND gate and I'm gonna output a high. So that brings me to the hold condition. So if I'm in the hold condition, that means Q is gonna remain unchanged. And that means um, that it's gonna remain zero because I just made the assumption that it was zero. So let's divide this up and say that if R bar is high, meaning the previous Q was zero, then that's the hold condition. So Q is gonna remain zero, it's gonna stay what it was before, and Q bar is also gonna stay what it was before. But now, if Q was high before, so, if my, so I considered the condition where Q was low, and we said that that would bring me to the hold condition. But if Q was high, 
then I will have three highs going into this NAND gate. And that means that all of my inputs are high and it's going to output a low. And I'm going to be in this condition where I have S bar is one, R bar is zero, which I know is the reset condition because remember R bar is active low. So that also brings me to zero one. Uh, so regardless of what the previous value of Q was, I know that if J is zero and K is one, I am in the reset condition and Q is gonna be zero and Q bar is going to be one. So far, so good. So I'm going to use the same reasoning to look at what happens when J is high and K is zero. So let's go over it. So again, like there's a lot of logic here and you may want to, if you kind of get the um, gist of it, you can fast forward through this part, but I want to prove it to your satisfaction. So let's look and see what happens. So it have the condition where, um, well, let's look over here at K. So I'm going to start with K. K is zero. So right away, I know that one of the inputs to this NAND gate is zero. The output is going to be high. So the output of that NAND gate is the R bar signal. So R bar, no matter what, is going to be high. So I'm going to write that here. But I have two possibilities for S bar. So it's similar to the other condition. So I have two possibilities. So let's look over here. I'm looking at the input J. So I know that J is high. It's the rising or sorry, falling edge of the clock. Actually, this row over here is the falling edge of the clock. So this signal is high because I have a falling edge detector. It outputs a high at the falling edge. So this signal is high. This signal is high. What's this signal? Okay, well, I have two choices. I can have the condition where Q was one and Q bar was zero, right? Because remember that they're always complementary to each other. This input is Q bar. I just said that I'm considering the case where Q bar was zero. So prior to this falling clock edge, Q bar was zero. As soon as I have a zero input, I'm in set bar. I know the output of this NAND gate set bar is going to be high. And if set bar is high, that's the hold condition because I just said R bar was high. So I'm going to, I'm going to leave it holding at one zero. Remember? Cause that was my assumption that Q bar was zero and Q was one. So I'm going to put that here one and zero, but let's see what happens in the other condition where Q was zero and Q bar was one. So Q is now zero. Q bar is one, right? All inputs of this NAND gate now are high and it's going to output a low set bar is active. That's the set condition for my SR NAND latch. So I'm going to write that here. I'm in the condition zero one, which, uh, where S bar or S is active and R is inactive basically. And my latch is setting, meaning I'm going to remain at, I'm going to have one zero. So either way, regardless of what, Q was prior to this, either way, no matter what, I'm gonna end up with a one zero. If Q was zero before, it will now be one. And if Q was one, it will hold and remain one. So cool, so far so good. And now I'm gonna look at this last situation. And this is where, like so far you can see that this is actually the same as the SR flip-flop. There's no change, right? This is where it all changes. So if you remember going back to the SR flip-flop, this was the condition when S and R, when both inputs were high, S bar and R bar were both zero and that was the invalid condition. So let's see what happens here. So now I have this kind of feedback from the outputs into the pulse steering circuit. What is gonna happen? Okay, so this is gonna get a little complicated. So work with me here. All right. So I have J and K both high. So that's both. So I know that in both of these NAND gates, I have at least two inputs high. 
Okay, so actually, let's break this out into its own truth table. So I know that no matter what, J and K are high. I'm, I'm only examining this condition where they're both high. But now I'm going to look at previous state. I'm going to call the previous state Q and Q bar, but I'll, I'll denote them with a little minus that they're the previous states. So these are my inputs. This is my previous state. And I'm gonna just call this my next state. But basically they're just my outputs, Q and Q bar. Okay. And essentially I know that no matter what, J and K are both gonna be high because that's the condition I'm looking at. I'm trying to figure out this row of the truth table. And, and, and I also know that it's the falling edge of the clock um, because I've said it's the falling edge of the clock, right? Because if like as soon as the clock is not on the falling edge, these NAND gates over here, they are just going to output high, both of them, and that's the hold condition for the NAND latch. So I am going to look first at the case where Q um, or previous state Q is zero and Q bar is one, and the other state where Q is one and Q bar is zero. I don't need to consider invalid states because I will never, in my perfect world, I will never get to an invalid state for my latch. So Q and Q bar are always gonna be complementary. Okay, so let's look what happens. So I'm gonna consider the case where, and maybe I'll denote this in yellow. So basically, I know I have a one here. I have a one here, it ends up being red. I have a one here and I have a one here. So it's just a question of what's coming in to the other, um, to the, uh, into the other input of the NAND gate. So again, I'm looking at the first row over here. If Q is zero, then this input is zero and Q bar is one. So this input is going to be one. So that means that all three inputs are high, set bar is going to be low. So I said that S bar is going to be low, but R bar, which is the output of this NAND gate, R bar is going to be high. That's the set condition. This, uh, that's the set condition for my latch. So if I go back and look at my NAND latch truth table, I know that my next state is gonna be one and zero. So I started off, remember, my previous state I said was zero, one, and I ended up with one, zero. Okay, so now I'm gonna look over here. So again, as before, J, K, and clock, star, I should say, are all, and I'm trying to delete everything, but I ended up deleting more than I wanted. So I know that at least two of the inputs to these NAND gates are high. And now it's a question of looking at the other ones. So I have, I'm looking at this row over here. So my previous state Q was one. That's this was one. So good, that input is high. And now I can confidently say that reset bar is going to be low. So I'm gonna write that. Okay, and Q bar is low, right? That's this, Q bar is low. I have the input zero, one, one, but as soon as I have any zero coming into this NAND gate, I know that the output is going to be high. The output is set bar, output is high. Okay, so this is my reset condition. So for my NAND latch, so my next state is going to be Q is zero and Q bar is one. So this is really interesting. So my previous state, when my previous state, and this is where it kind of like, it diverges from the SR truth table. When my previous state was Q was zero and Q bar was one, I now have Q is one and Q bar is zero. Conversely, when I had my previous state as 
q equal to one and q bar equal to zero, now I end up with zero and one. So what is this? This is the toggle condition. So I'm gonna say C below. So basically this was reset, this was set. And this is why I don't call my input set and reset now because actually they can both be active or high in this case at the same time. So um, when, and, and now like I've kind of removed that whole invalid um, aspect to my SR. So essentially the JK truth table looks exactly like my SR flip-flop truth table, except that I no longer have an invalid condition. I've replaced it with a toggle condition. And I'm gonna show you one more kind of flip-flop. And then I'm just gonna do a summary. So this flip-flop, I'm gonna call the D flip-flop. And it too, just like the JK flip-flop, will be based on the SR flip-flop, but you don't have to brace yourself for something super complicated here. Because now, the only thing that I'm going to do is I'm gonna use my SR flip-flop as a building block. And I am going to do the following. I'm gonna extend this set. I'm gonna call it a D. And what I'm gonna do here is I am going to keep a little inverter or insert a little inverter here and wire it to what my reset should be. And now I'm gonna put a box around this whole thing. And you can see that again, I have Q and Q bar outputs as before. And just to be clear about it, I still have my clock input like that. It's a little awkward looking, um, but I still have a clock input. Again, it is a flip-flop, okay? I still have a clock input, but now I only have one input and that input is D. And to write the truth table, so let's again take a look at the SR flip-flop truth table. So we're gonna start by using that as our starting point. So basically this over here, this was my SR flip-flop truth table or clocked SR flip-flop truth table. One thing I am missing, of course, is the clock input. So sometimes it's just implicit. Sometimes I don't explicitly put it, but the clock is either gonna be, um, or the flip-flop is either gonna be um, positive or negative edge triggered. And again, things only happen on the edge of the clock. Now, to be clear about this, a flip-flop can only choose one. It can only either be positive edge triggered or negative edge triggered, but not both. Okay, so D now is gonna represent, so remember that I've just wired um, set to the inverse of reset. So set and reset are always gonna be the opposite. So what am I looking at? I'm looking at only these two rows of the truth table here. So essentially I can strike out these rows where S and R are the same. Those do not exist in the D flip-flop. Why? Because I've wired an inverter between S and R and I've called the input D. So essentially uh, R is always gonna be the opposite of S in my internal SR flip-flop over here. So essentially I can see that um, D is zero, corresponds to S is zero, and R is gonna to have to be one. It has no choice because it's the inverse or complement of S. So when D is zero, that's the reset condition. And when D is high, that's the set condition. And basically what does that mean? It means that Q is always gonna be what D is, but at the next clock cycle. So we are, this may at first glance look a little useless and you may wonder like, what is this good for? But actually it's a very basic memory element and we're gonna see lots of applications for it later on. But for now, that's all you need to know. So as promised, let's pause to do a little, I mean, this was a lot of information to take in. So let's pause to kind of synthesize it a little. We covered in this video, three different flip-flops. Now there is a fourth flip-flop that I haven't told you about called the T for toggle flip-flop. And that's just, basically you can think of it as a JK flip-flop where J and K are wired together. 
but we don't really need to talk about that. I'm just mentioning it here for thoroughness. But the flip-flops that we covered are these three, the SR, the J, K, and the D. So the differences between them are laid out in their truth tables. So in this truth table, I have not shown, there is another output that I have not shown called Q bar, which is the complement of Q, but I haven't shown it because you should know that if Q is zero, then Q bar will be one, and if Q is one, then Q bar will be zero. The other thing is there is another input that I have not shown, and that input is the clock input. And I haven't shown it because you should also assume that all changes occur only at the clock edge. Now, if it's a negative edge triggered flip-flop, those changes will only occur at the negative edge of the clock. And if it's a positive edge triggered flip-flop, the changes will only occur at the positive edge of the clock. So again, these truth tables sort of allied a lot of detail. There's a lot of detail in there that we haven't talked about. So again, don't forget the all important clock input. If the, um, if an edge of the if we're not on the edge of the clock, you're at any other point in the clock cycle, then Q cannot change. Now, this is not entirely true, as we will see when we look at timing diagrams and asynchronous inputs. But for now, we can just assume that these with these control inputs that we're looking at, these are called synchronous, and they can only have an, what are they synchronous with? What are they synchronized with? The answer is with the edge of the clock. So they can only affect the output at the edge of the clock and at no other time in the clock cycle. So that being said, and actually maybe it's worth it here just to go over a little bit more detail. So basically you can see that the SR and JK are exactly the same and J behaves like set and K behaves like reset in all respects except one, which is this last row of the truth table. So you can clearly see that the JK flip-flop is actually somewhat superior in the sense that we don't have an invalid state, so we don't have to worry about S and R being high at the same time or the inputs being high at the same time, because if they are, that's a valid condition. It's not gonna set the flip-flop into an invalid state. It will simply toggle, meaning that whatever Q was, it'll be the opposite of what it was. It'll be Q bar, basically, at the next clock edge. And then the difference between SR, JK, and D is, of course, there is only one input. And remember that this actually corresponds to, it doesn't really matter if I'm looking at the SR or the JK, but it really corresponds to the second and third rows of the truth table where the inputs are opposite to each other. Because remember, one is the inverse of the other. And you may ask yourself, like, what is the point in this? But it's, but we will see that there is there is a purpose for this. So essentially, you can think of the D flip-flop as sort of Q follows D, but at the next clock edge. So Q will become whatever D is, but only at the, evaluated at the clock edge. Now, this will become a lot clearer when we do timing diagrams. So we'll go into all this in a lot more depth. So here's another um, sort of summary. Um, and now we're rather than looking at the different kinds of flip-flops, we're going to look at the difference between latches and flip-flops. So here I've, um, I, I've got basically two um, characteristics of control inputs. What are control inputs? Control inputs are basically the only inputs we have learned about so far to latches and flip-flops. They're things that control its output. Um, so, for example, for the uh, NOR and NAND latches, they would be set and reset. Um, for the SR flip-flop would be S and R. JK flip-flop would be JK. And Z flip-flop, it would be D. So that's pretty easy to remember in the case of flip-flops. Um, when we say synchronous, what do we mean by that? So we actually mean, is it synchronous with a clock? Is it synchronized to a clock? So this is really important in logic circuits. Timing is everything. And it's really important to have the timing of all elements in a circuit um, synchronized together. And they are synchronized with the help of a clock. Um, so, uh, we look at, are these control inputs, are they active only at the edge of a clock or are they active at any time in the clock cycle? If they are, we call them asynchronous. They're not synchronized to a clock, but if they are only active or, 
um, have an effect at the edge of the clock, then we call them synchronous. So we know that actually what distinguishes latches and flip-flops is the presence of a clock input. So latches themselves do not have synchronous control inputs. Their control inputs are asynchronous. And flip-flops, on the other hand, are always, they have synchronous control inputs. So um, the other thing that we're going to look at is this concept of active high and active low, which we really only saw with reference to the NAN latch thus far, but we will be visiting it further in um, later lessons. So um, when we say active high or active low, we mean does the control input, again, we're talking about control inputs, do they have their intended effect when the signal is high or when the signal is digital low? And for the NAND latch, as we saw, it was active high, but the NAND latch was active low. So you remember we indicated that with the um, little bar over the name of the input. Um, Flip-flops, flip flops, on the other hand, are all high. They um, where the control inputs that we've looked at so far are all high. And we will see, in fact, I'll leave you with a little teaser, that in fact, sometimes you may think it is useful to sort of be able to affect the output of the flip-flop at any point in the clock cycle. So flip-flops, in addition to these synchronous active high control inputs, also have asynchronous active low control inputs. Well, I mean, sometimes they're active high, but they're asynchronous. So there are additional inputs that can have an effect on the flip-flop at any point in the clock cycle, but we needn't concern ourselves with that for now. But it will come into play later. We'll do a bunch of timing diagrams and we'll take these asynchronous control inputs to into account. And again, if I have um, so I'm just going to show you some conventions again. So I indicate the clock with a triangle. This kind of looks like a door. If it's a negative edge triggered clock, I will put a little bubble at the output. I will put my inputs here and my outputs Q and Q bar. So again, this is some mystery flip-flop. I haven't told you what type it is. Um, but I will tell you that if I have additional inputs, I can indicate them as follows. So I will also uh, draw a line to indicate that they're inputs like so, but I'll put this little bubble and this little bubble signifies that the input is active low. So I have, so far we've seen two ways to indicate that an input is active low. We have seen that I put a bar over the name of the signal. And the other way is in the a corresponding schematic representation of the element, I will denote the input with a little bubble. And that tells me that the signal is active low. And um, it is worth it also to say that if I have that bubble at a clock input, that tells me that it's negative edge triggered. That's what it indicates. So those are the conventions we're gonna use going forward.